the interest in improving public sector policy and those elements that create ecosystems fostering vibrant, competitive, innovative, and equitable development across sectors. She has an extensive experience of evidence-based policy development and implementation, as well as of advocacy and policy compliance from private sector's perspective. Ms. Issa, Issa Shahbaz works at Karandaz as a principal corporate investments and credit, where she has developed and manages a portfolio of approximately 200 million US dollars across various programs and asset classes while development De developing innovative solutions to enable sustainable growth of the MSMEs across target markets and achieving double bottom line objectives via blended financing structuring. Ms. Kiran Afzal is the senior private sector specialist with the FCI GP based out of the Pakistan country office. She is tasked, she is leading three World Bank group interventions on tourism of the sub-national level. She also works on jobs competitiveness and micro, small and medium enterprise matching grants activities in the country's Northwest and Punjab province. Mr. Fahim Sardar is currently a senior policy specialist with the government of Pakistan, focusing on economics among, among other aspects. Prior to this, he was the managing director of Tangent, which is an economics think tank and corporate advisory, and has also served as the chief executive officer at Askari Securities Limited in Pakistan, which is a leading brokerage and investment house in Pakistan. So I'm very grateful to all of you who have joined us today. And uh, without further ado, I'd like to move forward to the discussion. And uh, firstly, I'd like to invite Mr. Aryan for his welcome remarks. So over to you. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you so much, uh, Manor, and, uh, and and thank you to uh, SDPI for uh, for inviting me. It's a, it's a great uh, great honor. It, it's uh, thank you to uh, the, the other panelists uh, from uh, uh, government, uh, from industry, for for, for joining me in this uh, this uh, event. As uh, Manor said, I I am the uh, I, I am. Uh, uh, a program specialist at the, at the International Development Researcher, and and uh, by way of welcome, let me perhaps tell you a little bit about uh, where this collaboration came from, as the and and, and put the, perhaps a little bit of background of the other activities that we've we are currently supporting and have supported throughout the pandemic. In, in with that, I, I just I, I do from the start want to congratulate SDPI as, as as many of our partners in in very difficult circumstances for the for the wonderful work they uh, they, they have done. Uh, I, I can I, I dare see the International Development Research Center is part of the Canadian government uh, development uh, program. We're, we're a separate organization, but part of the uh, part of the Canadian program. And in April, March, April 2020, when the pandemic uh, started, we very quickly felt that we needed a, a large response to that pandemic of course at that point of time nobody knew how long this pandemic would uh, would last and how big the impact would uh, would be but we definitely felt uh, that it was was, was essential to uh, to to provide the support for research to 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 help inform the kinds of policies that we saw uh, emerging immediately and, and and pakistan was 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 no exception and in some cases leading uh, in in the immediate uh, responses that were uh, were initiated um so the, the support to S, uh, sdpi was was part of a large program that supported some 21 projects around the world uh with with some 40 organizations like like as the uh, sdpi many of your sister brother organization in in other countries uh and 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 we we Build that on the long collaboration uh, IDRC has had with, uh, with with SDPI, probably going back to at, at least at least a decade and, and a half, uh, where we've seen the wonderful work and be privileged to to support that. The proposal that SDPI put to us uh, to focus on on three themes. So we're discussing on one of those on the three themes of food security, on social protection, which we'll see in the in, in the future, and small and medium enterprises was uh, was absolutely 
absolutely, absolutely spot on. Uh, we've seen the result of the work on food security, it, the excellence of the research, uh, the impactfulness of the research, the way that SDP, the, the work of SDPI is shared with, is made relevant for, and is shown to be relevant to, with with development partners in private and public sectors has been uh, has been really stellar. And and again, I I, I want to congratulate SDPI on uh, on this work. Uh, the, of course, the impact that the pandemic had and the policies for small and medium enterprises is absolutely critical. Uh, most people and, and often vulnerable people in, in Pakistan do work in small and medium enterprises uh, that have their own dynamics, have their own vulnerabilities uh, and, and, and the government and, and had distinct impacts and the government support for that is very important and the analysis of the things that have worked and haven't worked is absolutely critical for those immediate policies but also in terms of lessons for the year uh, for the long term within that the one thing i want to mention and and again thank sdpi for how it has analyzed and is continuing to analyze the distinct impact uh the role of women in those small and medium enterprises again their dyna that dynamics and vulnerabilities uh the the, the policies that uh, that uh, that support women find out which policies how they can be be changed to to play a more proactive role in women's uh, women's e e uh, women's empowerment and gender equality uh, is one of the distinct distinctive features of the uh, of the work and 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 again congratulations to SDPI for uh, for its work in this area so again thank Vakar and, and uh, Manor I'm turning back to you uh, thank you for inviting me uh, thank you to all the panelists and looking forward forward to, uh, to hear uh, the presentations. Thank you very much, Ariane, for those welcome remarks. Uh, moving further, I'd like to invite Dr. Vakar Ahmed to please uh, start his pre technical presentation. Over to you, sir. Thank you, uh, uh, Manur. Let me try and share my screen. And please do confirm if you can see it. Yes, sir, it's visible. Okay, okay, great, great. Thank you, Ariane, for setting the stage. And of course, I join you in thanking the other uh, esteemed panelists who have joined us today. Uh, let me just quickly to set the tone of the discussion, present some of the findings uh, from our report. And I think the report comes at a very important time, uh, just when, of course, we have the learnings from COVID-19. Uh, but of course, Pakistan has been struck by another uh, equally uh, challenging uh, disaster, which is the floods. And currently, we have 33 million people displaced at the moment uh, across 81 districts of Pakistan. So, uh, so, so the reason uh, we had timed the presentation uh, in a manner that now that rehab and reconstruction activities are starting and there will be some recovery packages, some fiscal response for the smaller and medium enterprises. What are those lessons from COVID times that can uh, be packaged into whatever recovery response that Pakistan uh, finalizes for its micro, small and medium enterprises going forward? And I'm sure that other esteemed panelists have uh, far more experience in, in delivering such support. And I look forward to hearing uh, from them as well. Now, uh, when we started off, of course, with uh, uh, Aryans and IDRC's uh, support, you know, uh, the research objectives, broad research objectives uh, included how changing nature of disaster was impacting MSME's performance. And as most will agree, COVID was a changing uh, sort of goalpost for all who, was try who were trying to adapt to things. Uh, and whatever you had done in the first wave may not be relevant in the second wave. And all six waves had a very different uh, nature of how policymakers were, were expected to respond to the challenges. Uh, what were the sector specific vulnerabilities? Uh, how the economic risks differed for women-led enterprises, how they differed for enterprises involved in cross-border trade, what, was, what were the varying nature of challenges for urban versus rural MSMEs, and what would be the, the, the need assessment for MSMEs going through 
recurrent challenges. As I said, that the tourist areas of Pakistan, the northern areas of Pakistan, which were hit hard by the lockdowns, have again been hit very hard by the flash flooding. And I think in the delivery of these research objectives, I have two of uh, our co-authors here, Dr. Adil Nakhuda and uh, Maz Javed, including the survey team, uh, which, which contributed, and I'm sure that they will uh, explain the scope and objectives uh, further uh, once, of course, I, I hand them over. Uh, the methodology was essentially a mixed methods approach. A desk review was uh, carried out, which helped us in really refining uh, a questionnaire, a firm level questionnaire, which was implemented around the end of the second wave of COVID. And uh, then I'm sure Dr. Adil will explain that making use of that data, there was a very extensive analysis based on the diffusion index, followed by an econometric analysis, which has gone into this report. The, the firm level survey included 750 uh, micro, small, and medium enterprises. And we covered all provinces, including uh, AJK, Gilgit, Baltistan, and Islamabad. The key sectors which were selected for the survey included agriculture, manufacturing, construction, retail, and transport. And this selection was based on several criteria, including th these sectors' contribution to provincial GDP, sector contribution to GDP, share of formal and informal sector, uh, as well as the proportion of urban and rural sector, which was intensive uh, in this mix of sector selection. A conscious effort was made to involve as many women-led enterprises as time and resources allowed, but I'm happy, happy to share that the final valid responses that we received, we have 11% uh, women-led firms uh, in these uh, women-owned and women-led firms in this sample. Now, the main themes that come across in this research, uh, and they apply to COVID, they apply to the flash floods that we have seen. It's about supply chain disruptions, which these smaller firms are facing. It's about the various channels through which they are affected, supply side, demand side. How resilient these firms are against recurrent crises. What are their sector specific needs? Of course, it becomes difficult when government is trying to uh, find out about these sector specific needs in real times. But then government is also trying to find out what is working and what is not working in terms of the support it is extending. So effectiveness of the government support package, impact, real time impact on cash flow, employment, production. Then of course, there are structural barriers that get exaggerated uh, during such crisis as well as the impact of contingency measures on cross-border trade, particularly during COVID times, because countries had taken protectionist measures, uh, at least those countries where Pakistan's exports uh, usually uh, go to. Now, in the backdrop of these main themes, and when, when one tries to uh, sort of approach all these themes together, there's a lot of noise in the research which uh, needs to be sort of one needs to find out what is working and, uh, and what is not working amid all that noise or, or, uh, or, or uh, information load which is coming your way. So it was important that the research team keeps to a, a certain framework and, and that framework sort of helps to explain what is the transmission channel at work over here. So we worked with our colleagues at the World Bank's trade and competitiveness team and we found that in the first and second wave of COVID, or, or just when any crisis hits you, there, there, there are four main channels at work. One, of course, are the demand channel. Consumers become uh, more anticipatory, reduce their short-term consumption. Uh, they, 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 there were fallen export orders from abroad. The supply channel meant that there was reduced access to imported inputs. There were closures uh, reported of businesses, worker absenteeism, reduced labor productivity. And third was the financial channel, which was the liquidity squeeze, high volatility in financial markets, pressure on firms, particularly uh, high leveraged corporates, which in turn affect credit to SMEs. And finally, the uncertainty. The firm level expectations were at play and uncertainty, uh, of course, length of the outbreak was not known, depth of uh, 
the outbreak on human or, or labor health going forward, panic in extreme circumstances as soon as some cases were found in offices or factory floors, for example. So these were the several channels that were reported uh, in the survey, in turn leading to lesser investment, lesser working capital, uh, and lesser ability to service uh, debt, which was there uh, in terms of export financing or other debt instruments. Now, the fiscal response of the government uh, uh, really looked at three or four uh, areas uh, which was provided to MSMEs, including relief in utility bills, concessional loans, ease in tax compliance, loan repayment deferrals, relief in rental commitments, and similar replication of uh, fiscal response was seen by the provincial governments as well. Uh, some of whom, of course, tried not to uh, uh, go back to the same beneficiaries, but try and find out those beneficiaries where federal response wasn't reaching. But one footnote is important to wear that this time around in the flash floods, while uh, the damage to GDP uh, would be almost equal or more than the first or second wave of COVID, uh, we may not be able to give this kind of a fiscal response as has been made clear in the seventh and eighth review of IMF. So I would invite our uh, panelists to uh, really advise us that if such uh, fiscal space is not available with the government, uh, how, how could we be sort of innovative in providing relief or package the fiscal response in a much better manner so that uh, fund would be sympathetic to that package or allow that space to deliver that package to the micro and small firms. Now, firms also pivoted on their own. And as we find out in our survey, uh, innovative firms have actually led to good progress during crisis times. We have almost a quarter of firms informing us that during lockdowns, they were investing in capacity building of their HR to adapt to crisis. We had 35% firms informing us that they were able to introduce new technologies, for example, going online. For firms in trade, there was a push for market and product diversification. Some of the firms, due to their good relationship with domestic and foreign clients, were able to demand advanced payments. Loans from formal and informal sources uh, were, uh, were at play. Uh, some firms were able to convince uh, employees for uh, salaries or golden handshakes. And where possible, they were able to bear a short-term decrease in the variable operating costs. There were, of course, many other areas, but these would be like top uh, seven or eight uh, uh, ways in which the firms were trying to pivot. In our sample, we had around 4% uh, uh, firms who were facing a closure uh, or possibility of closure by the end of the second wave of the COVID. It'll be good to at some point go back to those firms and see if they were able to survive. Uh, there were possible reasons for firms who were not able to avail government support. And amongst those, the four main reasons of not availing the government support. First was that some firms had either high information costs or they lacked even basic information that there was some government support out there. So you find this reason coming from Balochistan, Western Khyber Pakhtunkhwa, Gil Gilgit Baltistan, uh, including South Punjab, where uh, respondents have informed of such lack of information. Those who did know reported about the second factor, which was that the process of availing government support was cumbersome, or there were some transactions costs associated which they could not bear. Uh, third, there were uh, reasons such as where respondents were preferring informal borrowing, uh, probably due to their perceived notion that there could be strings associated with formal borrowing, or they may have to disclose their assets, or they may prefer to remain informal maybe. And then finally, there was the, the, the liquidity crunch at one point became so acute that for some of the firms to wait for government support was not possible. And they ended up, of course, burning own resources on immediate basis. And these were some of some some of the reasons for not availing uh, government support. We, we we had around a 
a quarter of firms who did not go for government support but reported cash flow problems. Firms also informed of how they would have liked to see an improved fiscal response. For example, we, we note that the younger firms and Pakistan has seen a startup revolution in, in recent years on the back of uh, good uh, uh, tax and tariff policies which were introduced, which were pro-startup. But these younger firms were more exposed during the COVID times, their sustainability was uh, at risk. We also see that SMEs and cross-border trade were more exposed. The energy cost concession for lifeline firms was limited. There were costs associated with introducing SOPs, uh, particularly during COVID times. And these SOPs were majorly faced by or reported by medium-sized firms. And the two things which I think policymakers uh, would, would need to look into, one, that firms have reported that ease of tax compliance, which was introduced, simplification of tax filing, which was introduced, our respondents have informed that they didn't see any significant impact on time or cost involved in taxation. Second, they did not see logistics costs going down, although the government had taken measures uh, across the transport chain, uh, including at ports, but the respondents, according to them, uh, this response was limited and it didn't lead to reduction in logistics costs. So these would be areas where I think we need to sit with the government partners and see that how in crisis times, fiscal response can cover this, this, uh, uh, the, 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 these points given by the private sector. Now, firms in trade uh, were also facing some certain special problems, of course, given that importing and exporting countries had fast changing rules during COVID. Uh, timeliness of shipment, ability to track and trace, varying insurance arrangements. Some countries totally closed themselves even if insurance was possible, uh, including China, for example. Quality of logistic services varied. We have seen this in the flood times as well. There have been time delays in delivery. And a more conscious buyer or a more conscious importer of Pakistani goods was now asking for a more stringent health and hygiene standards going forward. We also note that the cost of trade documentation increased and it increased to the tune of somewhere around 1.6 million for medium-sized, small and medium-sized firms per annum. As per the cost estimates given, these documents are related to logistics, regulatory compliance, LC processing, customs, and anti-narcotics. And all of these uh, uh, documentation, of course, add up to the trade costs, cost to import, cost to export. Now, what is influencing small firms' cost structure in the short to medium term when the crisis strikes? We find that there were three main areas. One, of course, was that due to the decrease in domestic demand, uh, the same fixed cost which was earlier spread over a larger number of clients was now sp spread over a smaller number of clients. Second, uh, and post, of course, crisis around the third or the fourth wave of COVID, we saw a depreciating rupee so that the real value of borrowed sum was declining. And third, continuous increase of raw material cost coupled with decrease in availability of raw material and intermediate goods was observed. All of course leading to a very fast evolving uh, cost structure firm uh, which was leading to uh, lack of a smaller firm's ability to make longer term uh, investment decisions. Now, in terms of future business expectations, uh, the good news was that more than 50% of the sample reported having successfully pivoted and informed of greater resilience to face similar crises. Second, looking to further diversify product and market space, they were also focusing on product sophistication, which also talks about value addition. However, uncertainty around timelines required to reach pre-cup crisis level was observed. And one can, of course, understand that given that Pakistan was trying to renegotiate the terms with the fund, there were recurrent uh, balance of payment challenges due to external pressures, 
fast changing uh, energy costs. We're also pro uh, uh, promoting this uncertainty around the timelines. Another good thing that we observed was adoption of e-commerce channels. And more adoption relatively was seen with medium sized firms. And why is that? Because they had uh, the affordability they could afford that one-time sunk cost, which is which was expected in adopting e-commerce channels, which on average was reported somewhere around 0.3 million rupees. Outcome, of course, which they reported was increased sales, new opportunities reported by medium-sized firms. And probably a good thing that happened was that uh, COVID provided that opportunity to the federal government to really expedite the e-commerce policy at the federal level, which was then coupled with provinces uh, coming forth uh, on an equal footing and forming their own e-commerce councils, which have led to a more certain regime. Uh, there has been some introduction of uh, taxes on IT and ICT enabled services, but they are being reviewed by the government. Now, in terms of the women-led uh, enterprises, which Aryan also referred to, we find mixed success. For example, the probability of successful pivot was greater in Punjab and Sindh compared to other provinces. And uh, they were particularly vulnerable in case of Western Cape, including GB, uh, where, for example, lockdowns actually meant a cut down of supplies of raw material or access to markets. Uh, they, the, the, the micro and small women-led enterprises reported of limited access to formal credit and government support uh, remained weak, primarily due to weak information channels or probably because the cost of information was high. Some of them reported in applying, uh, difficulty in applying for government support. This may be a perceived challenge because uh, many of them probably didn't know whether in their local area there, was, there were offices or whether they could resort to some online uh, portal where they could apply for such support. Uh, Women-led enterprises involved in cross-border trade were mostly back end of formal sector, uh, and due to which most of them remained resilient, at least those women-led enterprises were involved in export of IT and ICT trade, uh, which is why we find that women in services trade pivoted well. Now, just to end, uh, the set of recommendations that we have given uh, in this report, we have split these recommendations. Um, there are, of course, more than what, what are displayed over here, but uh, these would be the main ones. But in the report, one finds that uh, we have split these recommendations into things to do for federal and provincial government and regulators, things to do by the private sector on its own, and things to do by, for example, areas where development partners can come from. So a couple of areas, for example, number one, communication in crisis times need to be seen by all uh, who were involved in the delivery. How can that uh, communication be more innovated? We saw uh, recently in the case of Sabat, for example, that when we lost communication, those early warning systems didn't work. Uh, you didn't have institutions uh, available for a good 28 hours who could inform about the crisis of the situation. There was no telephone, no mobile, no SMS service which could go through. Cross-border trade has to be aided with e-documentation. And I'm glad that Parks and Single Window is now taking some initiative. There's greater outreach that Parks and Single Window may consider. Thirdly, opportunities for smaller firms in government procurement, particularly those firms who had lost their trade share, they could be uh, promoted through a fixed quota in, in government pro procurement, but with a sunset clause so that it doesn't promote inefficiencies. Uh, we still need to have a better understanding of which costs, input costs can be supported in the short term, how to su subsidize and how not to subsidize. Making new technologies and e-commerce adoption easy for smaller firms. And finally, as I said, we are faced with a more conscious international buyer we need increased compliance with new product health and hygiene standards. We have seen it in foods, in, in foods, uh, processed foods, uh, uh, surgical goods, pharmaceutical exporters, all of them are informing that their compliance costs have increased. They now need to pivot uh, uh, going forward in a manner 
that ultimately leads to uh, uh, overtime reduction in this compliance cost. There's going to be some learning in the process which can reduce uh, this, this, this cost as well. So I'll probably just stop over here. And uh, given that Dr. Adil Nakhuda, who was uh, a co-author in the report, is here, maybe I can uh, request him to expand on this presentation, including, of course, uh, his more recent inputs on how the nature of disaster, particularly during flood times, and the pressures that firms are facing has, has actually changed. Um, and as Manu said, uh, now we are moving towards our distinguished panel. So uh, we'll try and limiting ourselves to 10 minutes each. So maybe I'll hand over to Dr. Adil Nakhuda, please. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Vakar. Uh, so, start. Yeah. So, well, first, let me thank SDPI for the invitation. Now, before I begin, I would like to mention that uh, I have collaborated with SDPI on this recent study, which was titled uh, "Micro, Small, and Medium Enterprises and Crisis Times: Lessons from Pandemic Experience in Pakistan." And as Dr. Vakar has mentioned, I'll just focus my discussion on this study. So. Let me start with some of the salient features of the survey that we conducted. So it was conducted across Pakistan. The bulk of the respondents were not only younger firms, less than 10 years of age, but also uh, smaller in size with less than 10 employees. Now, these are mostly likely to be vulnerable to, uh, to shocks such as COVID or floods. And uh, uh, these firms are likely, the smaller firms and the younger firms are likely to lack the financial capacity as well as the necessary experience and skills to maneuver through a shock that involves abrupt closures and reduction in work hours. They may lack not only the capabilities to maneuver through these shocks, but also lack critical information on government incentives as highlighted by Dr. Wakar. Majority of the firms belong to the agricultural sector and retail sector and were mostly located in Punjab and Sindh. The agriculture sector and the retail sector are the largest employers in Pakistan. Hence the results of the survey not only cover the most vulnerable of the firms in terms of the size and age, but also focus on sectors that provide the most employment opportunities in the country. So second, uh, slightly more than half the firms were formal firms. The presence of regulatory barriers were a major reason why informal firms did not get formalized. Now this is important as unregistered firms may find it difficult to access government support measures that are provided during an economic crisis. A large proportion of the older small, smaller firms we found were informal indicating lack of opportunities for them to formalize over the years of their operation. The level of informality, however, decreased with size. Finally, a larger proportion of female respondents rep represented younger and smaller firms. Although it is also unlikely that more females are likely to work for larger firms, which by definition should employ more workers. Now I'll discuss some of the important issues related to the challenges faced by firms during the last couple of years and how firms have adjusted the practices to account for the challenges. Before I start, it is important to state that majority of the firms surveyed were operating as normal, but had reported significant challenges during the lockdown period as they had to either close their businesses or curtail their operations. Firms reported that their costs had increased while sales and production had declined during the lockdown. Now, even though firms were offered government support through different incentives, the most effective measures in the past ways reported by the firms that supported the survival was loans from private individuals. So this highlights the importance of informal financial markets that are likely to be important source of funds during a crisis in Pakistan. Although firms in KPK found loans from private individuals to be the most effective measure across all sectors, firms in agriculture and SIN also reported to be highly effective. And this is likely to be very important for the flood relief uh, packages that we provide. While younger firms are more likely to find loans from private individuals to be more effective, you also find that a large proportion of medium-sized firms also relied on such loans. This does raise questions on the effectiveness of the financial, uh, formal financial markets as firms both smaller and larger in size seem to be preferring informal financial markets for the support. Our firms, when asked about government measures preferred in the next six months, suggest micro-smart lockdowns targeting specific areas with high incidence rates, relief in electricity bills and concessional loans to be effective measures to support the businesses. It is important to mention that measures which ease uh, compliance with tax procedures received more negative responses and were deemed highly ineffective. Again, firms in KPK found micro smart lockdowns and relief in electricity bills to be the most effective tools 
while firms in Punjab and Sindh reported lower effectiveness of the Oxfam measure. Agricultural firms in Sindh were the most uh, skeptical regarding the ease in tax compliance. Now, this is again interesting, again, for the flood relief packages. The, neg the negative responses regarding the ease in tax compliance thus indicate significant challenges in tax collection as SMEs are unlikely to avail benefits from such measures. Easing tax compli uh, compliance procedures is unlikely to increase their numbers in the tax net. And that we have seen uh, with like a major uh, challenge faced by the government. So when it comes to possible reasons for not availing support, the biggest factor is the lack of information on government measures, as highlighted by Dr. Wakar. Providing adequate information on government measures is a major challenge. As expected, it is the younger and smaller firms that are likely to face challenges from lack of information. Larger firms are likely to have more access to their own savings than smaller firms, and this reduces their desire to avail government support. Now, the report also mentions the experience of firms during the pandemic in terms of the opinion regarding price volatility, cost of acquiring uh, raw materials, cash flow uncertainty, and consumer demand. We find that firms reported that price volatility and cost of acquiring raw materials to increase while cash flow certainty and consumer demand to decrease during the pandemic. Firms in KPK and Punjab were more responsive to these changes than firms in Sindh, while it was the medium-sized firms that were more impacted by the increase in cost of raw materials and price volatility. Rising costs may have hurt the balance sheets of relatively larger firms. The smaller and younger firms suffer from cash flow uncertainties and a fall in consumer demand. Now, another set of questions focused on the participation of firms in cross-border trade. Now, although the part, uh, proportion of firms that participate in cross-border trade is low, majority of them do participate, are located in Punjab and Sindh, and likely to be larger in size. Firms in the manufacturing sector are more likely to participate, followed by firms in uh, retail. Interestingly, there's little participation on firms in the agricultural sector in cross-border trade, which is a cause of concern, as again, the agriculture sector is the largest employer in Pakistan. The biggest deterrent for cross-border trade is the cost of logistics, while concerns on the quality of trade infrastructure and the ability of track and trace consignments is not ranked as relatively important. The increase in trade documentation is also a major deterrent, as firms report challenges related to regulatory requirements, certificate of origin, filing invoices, and letter of credit. Such challenges can be reduced with the aid of digitalization and improving the quality of outreach by different trade organizations, such as Meta, TDAP, et cetera. Lastly, firms worry about the ability to deliver their goods, which may lead to loss of clients and demerit charges during these crises. The pandemic had a significant impact on global supply chains, which again is likely to have reduced the desire of firms to participate in cross-border trade. So in conclusion, the pandemic created several challenges for firms as expected. Government incentives were provided to alleviate the concerns. However, several firms were unable to receive the benefits because many not only preferred informal ch uh, channels of financial support, but they also reported receiving little to no information on the incentives provided by the government. Further, the firms were not receptive to the easing in tax compliance while they did indicate relief in utility bills as an important measure. This suggests that firms are willing to receive concessions on their utility bills but not necessarily comply with tax procedures, even if the process is simplified. The results from this study are ever so important today as Pakistan faces yet another economic crisis along with the, flood, with the uh, issues related to floods. I believe that the government must look at why firms choose informal channels over the formal channels and whether government su uh, support measures are likely to be effective given that information on them, as well as access to them for SMEs remains poor. Thank you. So I'd like to end my on this yeah thank, thank you, you doc sir really really appreciate i'm glad that you gave the provincial a comparison as well uh, allowing of course uh, colleagues to actually uh, think through think through deeply into uh, how uh, the impact had varied across uh, the provinces uh, and thank you for your and uh, of course ibs partnership uh, towards this research uh, let me now move on to Ms. Nadia Seth. Uh, she's representing uh, Samida, Small and Medium Enterprise Development Authority at the Ministry of Industries. And they've really been at the forefront uh, with regards to really evaluating uh, the effectiveness of the government support across different sectors. They have come up with an SME framework as well, 
uh, which got approved. And of course, I think whenever we talk about supporting firms in crisis times, Samida is the first name that comes to mind in the overall public sector ecosystem. So it's over to uh, Nadia, Nadia Saiba yourself for your uh, remarks, please. Thank you very much. First of all, I'd like to thank STPI for you know, giving us some time and the opportunity to share some of our experiences uh, during the times of crisis and what our experience has been in terms of dealing with the SME sector. I must appreciate uh, STPI's research that you just shared and we look at, you know, we look forward to going a little more in detail on some of your findings that you've just mentioned. But just coming to some of the experience that we've had vis-a-vis -vis our interaction with the SME sector and particularly with the focus on COVID and what kind of a government response was, what was the uptake by the SME sector now that we are in the midst of another crisis through the floods, uh, what kind of a response is SMEDA looking at in terms of facilitating SMEs access? And I'll also talk a bit about some of the recommendations and I'm very happy to see actually some of the recommendations fall in line with some of the thinking that we've had in terms of planning and designing a rehabilitation program for the SME sector uh, uh, that has been affected by the floods in, uh, in uh, uh, across Pakistan. So just to say a bit of context um, while the sample that uh, you shared in terms of the SME during your survey statistics 5.2 million SMEs their contribution to the GDP is about 40 percent they are mostly informal in fact over 70 percent of informality exists when it, when we talk about the SME sector unregistered smaller size businesses more on the livelihood and sustainable uh, uh, sustainability of face a lot of sustainability issues because we're talking about very small size uh, enterprises uh, Smeda, at the very outset, when uh, COVID hit Pakistan uh, in April of 2020, launched an online survey just to get a very rapid sort of assessment of how businesses were in March of a particular month. So we conducted an impact of COVID-19, and there were there was a question. At 900 firms participated in that survey. Subsequent to that, we were involved in a study that was undertaken in collaboration with the Asian Development Bank Institute. It was a regional survey in which the regional countries, which included Pakistan, of course, uh, India, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, Mongolia, was undertaken, and we that report is was published. This was more based on a panel survey, so we've run four waves of this particular survey. Subsequent to that, again, we collaborated with, uh, with LUMS, uh, with the Mehbubul Haq Research Institute to really find out what was going on at a different point in time vis-a-vis -vis the impact of COVID because this was undertaken in 2021. So we had several data sets um, in terms of really understanding how SMEs were coping, what were the issues, and what kind of a government response could be formed to you know, support and facilitate uh, them staying afloat. Based on some of the work that SMEDA had done, the government announced uh, the electricity support package for small and medium uh, enterprises in which um, I won't go into details of uh, the package itself, but nevertheless, uh, 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 support was provided, of, a support of about 47 billion was utilized by small businesses during the, it was due to be up to an upper limit of 100,000 to 400, a lower limit of 100,000 for five kilowatt per hour, and then 450,000 for. I think we may be facing some disruption here. Yes, I also lost uh, communication yeah. with Nadia. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes, let it's better me, now. Let me do, Please. I think I probably issue. So we can switch that off and maybe if you can hear me better. Yeah, yeah. Okay, great. 
So then coming to the finance side, the State Bank of Pakistan launched its turf facility um, for, for businesses, about 435 billion rupees worth of finance refinancing was offered with over 600 cases being utilized until March 2021, according to the State Bank statistics. So for facilitating SMEs to stay afloat, that was another thing that was announced by the government amongst some of the other areas that support was provided, of course, some of them have already been mentioned, which includes tax relief. There were several programs that were launched by the provincial governments of Punjab in terms of providing wage support. So the uh, at the provincial level through the Punjab Rose Guard scheme, uh, program and similarly across with various provinces. So that's the kind of support that we were looking uh, that was provided during COVID times. Now, prior to this, NIDA had uh, experience of dealing with the floods in 2010. One of our flagship programs, and I'm glad to see Kiran to be part of uh, this conversation as well, which was the economic revitalization of Khyber Pakhtunkhwa and Pata, which was uh, a multi-donor trust fund program that SMIDA assisted the provincial government of Khyber Pakhtunkhwa in implementing. It was for rehabilitation activities across the uh, province of KP and the erstwhile Pata, in which rehabilitation grants and upgradation grants to SMEs were offered that were flood ravaged and uh, at that point in time. SMIDA was also part of another program by the name of Early Recovery and Restoration of Flood Affected Communities, a UNDP program in which it managed enterprise rehabilitation grants, livelihood restoration grants, and cooperative grants. Now, based on this experience, uh, in terms of our interaction that we have had with SMEs, in terms of the assessment of some of the uptake of the programs that were announced by the government of Pakistan during COVID times, we are currently engaging with the SME sector in de designing a response for rehabilitation of SMEs located in the flood affected areas. The lines upon which we are working on are, of course, based on some of the, at this point in time, we're conducting an initial rapid assessment, damage assessment. Um, this damage assessment will is based on some primary data that is currently being uh, collected in the field through our engagement with the chambers of commerce and trade associations, as well as through the engagement with provincial governments as well, so that we can come up with a response according to the needs of that particular community. Moving on, I'd like to bring this conversation to some of the things that you mentioned as part of your recommendations for designing such a program. Communication in crisis of times, if I recall correctly, Dr. Vakar mentioned was the number one recommendation that a number of people were unaware in times of COVID. This was also substantiated by the research that SMIDA conducted that hardly 50% of SMEs were aware of the support programs of the government that were offered during times of COVID. So we are trying to build in a communication strategy so that whatever support is coming either through SMIDA or the government response is adequately communicated to the SME sector. Coming to in input, uh, coming to your IT enablement, I'm. Uh, I'd like to share that SMIDA has just very recently launched a program for e-enablement of SMEs in which we have engaged third parties to train SMEs to become able uh, to become e-commerce savvy and to discuss how e-commerce e-enablement e e deployment in their firms can facilitate their businesses. This is a grants program. So basically, if you become part of the program, it is subsidized by the government through one of our initiatives. Regarding opportunities for small firms in government procurement, Dr. Vakar mentioned that very recently, the government of Pakistan announced an SME policy. And the SME policy looks at different thematic areas in which public procurement from SME sector is a very important and integral part of our initiative. We're currently in discussions with uh, the federal public procurement regulatory authority and with the provincial governments and what kind of a mechanism can be brought into play so that there is public procurement from the SME sector. So 
I'd uh, just like to end uh, here by thanking you all for the opportunity uh, given to SMEDA to participate in this. And we look forward to our further engagement with STPI and going through in more detail on the results that have been shared today. Thank you. Thank you indeed, uh, Ms. Nadia Seth, and uh, thank you for your participation. I think I really appreciate uh, your point on customizing the response for communities. Uh, and at some level, of course, these are very, very small communities. You talked about Khyber Pakhtunkhwa, and in that case, of course, it's 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 uh, it's reaching down to those village and neighborhood councils, VCNCs that we say, and the fact that they require a customized response. So thank you very much for highlighting uh, that. Uh, let me move on to uh, Ms. Iza Shahbaz Saiba from uh, Karandas. And I think uh, given her portfolio, uh, we wanted to request her for her inputs around constraints which are being faced by these businesses in raising capital, given that large part of their credit worthiness gets lost during uh, disaster times. And also the role of formal and informal uh, institutions during these crisis times in lending credit. So over to you, Iza Saiba. Uh, thank you, Dr. Bhattar. And firstly, I'd like to thank STPI for allowing me to uh, be part of the panel and IDRC for being a sponsor as well. Um, given the findings of your reports, I'll highlight uh, what are the constraints and partly I think your report covered a lot of points uh, where we see because we're generally directly dealing with the MSMEs. Um, so weak financials is a particularly interesting element because most of these SMEs make money, but they don't want to come into the tax bracket, which is the reason they do not make audited financials or the financials which are audited are pretty weak. Um, secondly, um, they generally maintain double books, which is also an issue when they want to go and raise capital from the, from the private market because um, their corporate governance, this allows them to constrain the corporate governance if you're maintaining double books. Thirdly, uh, because of the fact that you have big financials and these are generally family-owned businesses, so most of them, it's very difficult for them to graduate uh, to a more professional kind of governance structure, which will actually lead them into development of their businesses. So um, given that, and then they're not willing to give personal guarantees. This is also an issue. For them to raise commercial capital, the financial sector is heavily collateralized. So they can't actually access the formal market to raise financing in terms of expanding their businesses. Um, thirdly, um, there is a massive issue in terms of who um, they can approach because the informal market, they generally prefer going there and paying 36% as to the loan sharks to obtaining money rather than actually come into the tax brackets and then obtaining formal financing for growth capital. Because the constraints that you see when you start dealing with these businesses, they don't go after a particular time because they can't go to the formal markets, uh, either in terms of debt or in terms of raising equity capital. And because uh, we deal with both debt equity and strategic investments, so in terms of equity, if I look at um, the customers that come to us, um, this is generally the major concern. And then the role that the financial institutions can actually play and what we are doing really is when we start investing into a company, we actually have to ensure it's a year long process for us to formalize the business in a manner that we actually are able to invest. We are able to locate where the revenue is coming from. Um, we have to put in certain conditions in the agreements to uh, put in the governance structure in place where it comes the audit committee when you sit on the board, you try um, to formalize their business, expand their contracts to more um, capturing more official business and routing them a no cash transaction that generally allowed. But in the informal market, they're willing and easily able to do such things. How the financial institution can play a role, um, if I look at how we have expanded our portfolio with the financial sector. So we actually partnered with most of the financial sector on the party also to fund SMEs and go into areas where they would not generally use the capital for. I currently have five banks who I'm actually partnering with as under risk participation agreements. 
Um, one is Bank Kalpala, Mizan, and these are very conservative banks who would not go into KBK or would not go into the interior of Sindh or Balochistan. But we were able, uh, when they had approached us, they wanted us to just give them a non-funded guarantee as a first loss. And the financial sector would not want to lend to them. They were just like, okay, why don't you give us a first loss and we'll take as much risk as possible. But then what we have seen from our uh, experience also and with USAID and all the other entities, that the moment you remove the guarantee, none of those banks are going to lend. Because all um, they want to conserve the capital. So based on those learnings, we actually decided that we would not do any guarantees and we only do funded participation exposures. Based on that, we have been able to target more than 25,000 SMEs under our own programs. Even uh, when COVID was part of it, and if I look at how the response that we gave during COVID was, um, like the state bank had offered facilities um, and we won't qualify for state bank facilities because we are not part of, we're not regulated by SBP. However, what we did was that because we were participating with the banks, we allowed the banks to use our capital to actually um, allow extension of loans under our facilities as well. Um, we all knew that once the moratorium was lifted and the COVID facilities were going to be taken aback, we still had a fund to support the SMEs. So these are the kind of roles that the financial and non-financial sector can actually play in enhancing the capacity of the SMEs. And this is how we are doing it, especially in terms of debt and equity. Plus, um, what we have done recently, um, if you know, Parvaz is a non-banking financial company, which we have set up specifically for SME finance. Um, based out of Lahore, it's actually started working uh, last year, and we already built a book of uh, a billion on that balance sheet as well. Is it only there was some disruption in is I think there's some disruption in the Mas, can you hear is that? Uh, no, sorry. Uh, sorry. Uh, no, we can't yeah. hear. Yeah, yeah. Uh, maybe if if you can okay, turn yeah. off the camera, that may help. No, I think we 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 lost her. I think she left, or she may be trying to reconnect. Maybe or I just okay. I just give it maybe maybe just a few moments. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let me just ask her. Okay, we can maybe bring her back in the second round, uh, Maas. Uh, she'll be able to connect, you know. And meanwhile, maybe I'll request uh, Ms. Kiran Afsal from uh, the World Bank. And of course, I think as Nadia Sahib was also saying that uh, Kiran has been instrumental in designing uh, programs for MSME sector, particularly with the sector lens as well. We have heard her before in case of uh, uh, tourism sector enterprises. So that would be probably one area where I'd like to uh, request her for inputs that uh, uh, tourist sites have been uh, confronted with recurrent crises and uh, how should uh, a response package be better designed so that their resilience in future uh, can be improved in the face of these recurrent crises. So over to you, uh, Karan Saba. Uh -huh. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Vakar, uh, for inviting me to this panel and for sharing some uh, very insightful findings and recommendations from your survey. Um, I think all the surveys uh, for uh, uh, or the post crisis service should be structured in this manner because it provides very clear insights to policymakers and development partners. So um, just to confirm my own understanding, uh, would it be okay if I package the response uh, to address the post-crisis response uh, for both uh, pandemics and for the floods? Would that be okay? Yes, please. Thank you. 
Okay, thank you. So, um, uh, first of all, I think the way to start uh, responding to uh, such crises is to carry out a comprehensive uh, needs assessment of the sector to understand what kind of damages and losses have been incurred. And this is the uh, approach that the bank has been taking um, in countries that have unfortunately been struck with crises. And as you know, right now, uh, we are also jointly with the government of Pakistan and provincial governments and European Union, Asian Development Bank and United Nations. We are carrying out a post damage needs assessment for floods um, across the country. And in the process, uh, we are going to also look at categorically uh, the tourism and cultural heritage sectors. Um, unfortunately, in case of floods, um, the tourism enterprises and some of the heritage sites have been hit quite bad across the country. Um, tourism was the mainstay of the districts in KP where a flood has hit. And from the initial reports that we have found out about 50 hotels and restaurants, registered hotels and res restaurants have been damaged and would need to be reconstructed or rehabilitated. The other issue is that the heritage sites in Sindh uh, and in KP, they have, we have received reports of uh, damages in the affected districts, which means that, first of all, uh, yeah, so from basically in, just in KP province alone, the conservation or rehabilitation would cost around eighty to ninety thousand dollars, and these are the initial estimates that we are working on. Uh, that on the basis of which we are moving forward. The uh, thing uh, with the response is that we have to, and this is uh, uh, true both for pandemic, or natural calamity, and natural calamities that um, you just don't need to think about immediate rehabilitation or helping the enterprises to keep the lights on, but you need to impart resilience to them. So for not just that they build back, build back better, but they're also able to withstand shocks going forward. The good thing that's showing in your survey is that the private sector is very resilient. And as soon as the demand springs back, the private sector moves very quickly to respond. And incidentally, we are actually finding this out even in Afghanistan through our private sector survey that despite all the challenges and odds, um, there are few value chains which have already responded to the gradual pickup in consumer de demand by coming back. I'm, I'm by, by bouncing, bouncing back. The reason why I'm doing this comparison is that um, there is a strong case to move in with immediate support to the private sector uh, because these are the enterprises which will not help restore the jobs but they will create additional jobs also so uh, what we did through the world bank activities was as uh, nadia mentioned that in partnership with sameda as soon as the COVID pandemic uh, hit the province of kp uh, our ongoing matching grants project immediately uh, fine-tuned the eligible cri eligibility criteria for matching grants to include the enterprises that had been impacted by COVID the most. And about 40 to 50 matching grants uh, were disbursed to the entrepreneurs uh, which, had, uh, which met the eligibility criteria and few of them were in the tourism sector also. Because again, uh, during COVID-19, we all know that the tourism and travel industry were the first ones to be hit and the last ones to recover. Uh, same has been the case uh, in floods again, that uh, the tourism enterprises were most impacted. The road infrastructure is, you know, is really out of shape. So, um, so these efforts have already... Uh, you know, so so we need to now move forward in a more sort of organized manner. And like I said, the first step for us is to do a stock taking and inventory of the nature of damages and the and re, and the losses as a result of those damages and what kind of budget is going to be or numbers are going to be required to to uh, help the sector cope with uh, with both the damages and to recover from the losses. The other aspect which I think is very important to mention is that the public sector uh, needs to be better prepared to help 
uh, or to sustain, uh, to help the private sector sustain some of these uh, uh, damages and calamities. And in KP, especially, we saw that the emergency rescue centers, they sprung uh, into action very quickly and they were able to provide relief to tourists and uh, even to communities uh, which were stuck um, in, in flood and a lot of rescue efforts were done. So as an immediate response, we have spoken to the government of KP and even to the government of Punjab uh, to provide resources to our projects, World Bank projects, to beef up the capacity of the rescue services. This 1122 in KP, already a few tourist rescue stations were set up. So now more equipment is going to be procured and, and provided to those rescue stations. And these include the road clearing equipment, the uh, the diving equipment and ropes and, and you know, emergency gear and life uh, life saving kits and also the uniform and garbs for the uh, staff, uh, rescue staff so this is uh, the kind of response we are aiming at and i think in the so and the, a lot of this is immediate to short term but in the long term uh, whatever we are going to do on the infrastructure front and that's perhaps my message to everybody on this platform it needs to be the infrastructure needs to be climate resilient and we need to plan better. I mean, we cannot afford to uh, bring the enterprises on the same swaths of land which are in the way of floods or which, where we know that there is going to be any seismic activity going forward. The infrastructure needs to be built in a resilient manner. Uh, the encroachments should have no tolerance policy from the authorities and the private sector should be clarified that the building codes are there for a reason and you need to respect the bylaws and not uh, you know insist on um, constructing uh, enterprises or empires on 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 areas where uh, you clearly know that they are going to come in the way of the these uh, of, of of flood especially uh, so for this, we will be taking this up. Uh, we, we've already actually taken this up with the policymakers in the government of KP uh, so that there is clear message uh, to the private sector. So that is one. The, the other response is through our projects, which I have already mentioned. And I think also in the long term, the financial sector needs to come up with customized packages and they did in case of COVID and I'm sure they will in the case of floods also to uh, to be able to support enterprises that respect um, the 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 issues which are now facing us due to the climate change and like I said which also respect the building codes and anti-encroachment laws so these things need to be now integrated into the eligibility criteria. So these are a few messages which I wanted to share through this platform. If if I missed out of, uh, in responding to any of your questions, Dr. Vakar, please remind me. Uh, otherwise, I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kiran. And I think one of the very important points that you made was around uh, how public sector needs to be better prepared to help the private sector in such times. And of course, we often miss uh, the nexus. And this is how, of course, any response has to be focused. And I do see that while uh, you have examples where progressive chambers of commerce have come forward and they regularly engage with the public sector, mm -hmm. uh, I think uh, vice versa has also been seen. So it's important to document those successful case studies where public sector has been able to better mm -hmm. deliver. You talked about KP, so it's heartening to see that uh, KP is now uh, revising its uh, bylaws with more stringent uh, penalties uh, mm -hmm. going forward. And they're making this part of uh, uh, a provincial urban policy, uh, which, is, which is also uh, going to be a good initiative. It will go a long way in improving the resilience of our uh, uh, private sector, but including, of course, the response type of our agencies who are involved in helping them, including disaster response agencies like NDMA and BDMAs. So thank you very much. Let me now move on to Mr. Fahim Sardarsa, uh, who's at NSD in Prime Minister's office. And uh, of course, uh, during COVID times and during these flash flood times, 
uh, he has been uh, looking after this aspect of economic security in the country and of course has contributed to digital initiatives to support MSMEs. Uh, he was also instrumental in supporting the food security dashboard, uh, which also has potential to support uh, and help uh, food and agriculture sector MSMEs. So uh, over to you, Fahim, sir. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Bakar. Um, I would like to thank STPI and IDRC for this opportunity to uh, discuss uh, MSME situations and disaster times. Um, I'll try to keep this brief. Uh, before I get into uh, the impact of crisis on cross-border trade and the scope of e-commerce and digital initiatives to support MSMEs during crisis uh, difficult times, I want to say two things before I uh, delve into this. Firstly, that um, Pakistan has approximately 5 million SMEs of varying sizes. So we should keep in mind that there's a huge quantum that needs to be built up, a huge quantum that needs to be, uh, that can be used for outreach effort. And it's not just helping them, they can actually help you. So it's a two-way street. Secondly, and, and more importantly, uh, at least from my eyes, through my eyes is, is to identify hidden disasters and crises. And at the same time, just to balance things out, I think it's also important to identify hidden solutions as well. Sometimes, uh, you know, they're right there in front of us and so we sort of miss them. So uh, firstly, uh, can everyone hear me? I should have asked this earlier. Okay. So uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, Dr. Mughal. Firstly, the impact of crises on cross-border trade. So let's just deconstruct that very quickly. Cross-border trade, uh, it should ideally be regional trade, dominated by regional trade, sorry. Um, when we talk about trade, we, we have to identify close trade and far trade. So I'm just being binary, just to keep it simple at this moment, but there's a whole spectrum of costs associated to it, depending on how far you trade and how, how long it takes. So time, transport time, uh, documentary uh, clearance time, and of course, physical clearance time. Pakistan has brought them down to 24 hours from uh, respectively 55 to 75 hours, from 55 to 75 hours. But at the same time, we, we have to understand that uh, there has to be an overall simplicity in trade. And I'm talking about peace time, normal time. Uh, the question is disaster times. I'll get to that in a second. The Pakistan single window has been, it's been mentioned earlier by some of my colleagues here. And I just want to reiterate, uh, reverberate what they've said that um, it's doing a pretty good job, and, but it's moving in the right direction. It needs to keep simplifying things. When we talk about disasters and crises, firstly, uh, I have to stress, and I cannot stress this enough, uh, you have to also identify hidden disasters and crises, which might be below our threshold of understanding, maybe, but maybe low intensity, uh, because I've been working on this quite uh, intimately, and uh, the stuff that's come up has, has really shocked me, what kind of crises we've been dealing with, sticking to cross-border trade. Uh, we need to remain focused on the fact that crises are either man-made or natural. And in man-made, they are advertent and inadvertent. Inadvertent is some kind of a mistake that happens, which, which needs to be corrected. Advertent are in the form of something that's done willfully in the form of wars, of disruptions, of blockages, of violence perpetrated by anything. So that also, in my books, becomes a disaster. Not just floods or uh, not just uh, COVID, uh, but something that's been done willfully also becomes a disaster. So what is the effect? When we look at the effect of a crisis on cross-border trade, of course, your terms change, your costs go up, insurance premiums go up. And I believe even uh, Dr. Vakar had covered this very uh, extensively in his uh, very interesting presentation. I will not, of course, repeat what he said, but I'm just alluding to it that uh, everything changes, the terms of your trade, import, export of everything starts to change because the demand and supply then start to get blanketed, covered by different uh, layers, which sort of change the equilibrium. 
So any kind of disruption caused by any kind of reason, willful or non-willful, natural or uh, unnatural, it will cause a cessation of activity. And sometimes that is the objective. And that's something, for example, I'm looking at. Here, uh, it's quite sure that uh, we're looking at uh, uh, natural disasters. You have to be able to identify, I'm repeating this again and again, you have to identify what kind of disruption happened and uh, any kind of crisis that is willfully done has a much deeper and heavier impact as is the case of Pakistan. I have actually calculated the sum total of Pakistan's disasters and the number is shocking. Moving on to the scope of e-commerce and digital initiatives to support uh, MSMEs during difficult times. Um, there's something we used to say in corporate, it's evolve or die. So e-commerce e is an evolution of sorts where commerce, uh, can everyone hear me? Okay. Where e-commerce is where, where uh, um, your infrastructure is basically replaced by something electronic and simpler and the buyer and seller meet very quickly. Now, the world of e-commerce business is close to $6 trillion, shy of $6 trillion, and it's projected to grow at 20%, which is exponential. That is because of the simplicity. If you, if you look at any big business right now, if you don't have a digital presence, if you don't have an e-commerce structure, you cannot function. So even uh, during COVID, uh, one of, I'm not going to take any names here, but a very large bank of Pakistan had a very strange strategic meeting in which that bank said, listen, 50% of our employees are home and our bank is functioning just fine. So what are we doing with all this infrastructure, these buildings and so on and so forth? So there, there is a um, desire to be more lean, mean and effective, but a disaster does not announce itself. So let's see how adaptable businesses will still be. Pakistan has made leaps and bounds in e-commerce, but still well, we have to bear something in mind. As your e-commerce grows, as uh, I'll get to the initiatives in a second, as the e-commerce grows, so does cybercrime. When cybercrime grows, you're going to have a problem and that's a cost. And, and right now, Speaking from a cyber criminal's perspective, if, if we could be a fly on the wall and listen to what they're saying, it's a two, it's a two trillion, it's an industry of upward of two trillion dollars per year. That's what's documented and recorded. It's much more than that. So cyber cyber security also has to be built up at, at, the, at the civilian level. Uh, I'm not talking about the military level. When we talk about digital initiatives, I think what's very important is that. Um, for example, in Pakistan, what we saw and what we're going to continue seeing is the absence of an international as well as domestic payment gateway. We have some rudimentary systems. Nadra is coming up with something. State Bank has come up with something. But we have to integrate that with commerce and trade. And we have to make sure that the menu is proper for, for, for business uh, e-commerce to flourish. Just talk, by talking about e-commerce is not going to create it. We have to uh, make an ease in transaction ease of transaction for everyone for e-commerce to grow. Um, I personally, now this is uh, for those who uh, are familiar with finance, I personally have been working towards the barter system. I would love to hear, I would love to see a fintech app that allows electronically managed barter to happen. Why? You have to de, sometimes you have to take away currency from a market in which you have to allow the trade to continue. What happens is currencies become essential for trade, which tends to hold it back at times. Connectivity with people has to be improved, uh, visual connectivity, audio connectivity, and of course, digital certifications. Moving forward and to the end of what I was saying, the effect of uh, these initiatives is to ensure survivability in crisis times. And it is important for business and cash flows to continue um, if, if we can do away with the cash flow, that feeds up the whole process to begin with. In these crisis times, which uh, I personally have uh, been, been part of, uh, I've helped identify two disasters that were not being identified. Uh, they're slightly perhaps beyond the scope or at the periphery of what we're discussing right now. 
I've worked on policy continuity. Dr. Carlos is very kind to mention the food dashboard. I've tried to speed up the exports and um, also tried to make to decurrencify. It's a, it's a new word, markets. You have to take away currency from it. And of course, I've worked on the simplification of procedures of IT, amongst other things. So with uh, 10 seconds left, um, Dr. Sub, thank you for the time. And uh, I wait for the next round. Thank you, uh, Fahim Sab. I really appreciate your time today and uh, thank you for your inputs. I'm sure that uh, there may be uh, some questions. I understand that we are losing time fast now. I think we have eight minutes or so. And I also want to give it back to Aryan at the end for his closing remarks. But let me now request uh, my colleague, uh, Maz, because I think he has been following the Q&A. And we were also live streaming uh, over Facebook and LinkedIn. So maybe there are questions which he has uh, collected. And if he can pose those questions to you, and uh, maybe then we can give a minute uh, to each one of you to respond to them. Maz, it's over to you. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Uh, so I have just collected a few questions from social media and chat box. So what I have done is I have also posted these questions and uh, texted all the distinguished panelists so that if uh, there is some kind of disruption in my voice, uh, they can read that also. So I'm going to just uh, pose these questions in front of each panelist so, so that they can just answer it uh, very shortly. So first of all, I just wanted to request uh, Ms. Isa, uh, if something is left from, uh, from her talk, maybe uh, you can just finish it. And one of the questions that I want to pose is uh, how the women-led MSMEs can be helped uh, with the availability of concessional loans uh, when they especially lack the access to credit. Uh, similarly, another question uh, is for maybe uh, maybe I just wanted to like to request Ms. Kiran if she want to uh, respond to it. That uh, what has been the role of development partners in helping small industries to overcome uh, or to come out of the crisis when the economy is facing challenges or um, at at the multiple fronts. Uh, I just want to request Fahim Sab uh, again if uh, he want to come in. Uh, in uh, in ongoing inflationary cycle internationally, what policy steps can be taken uh, to assist uh, MSMEs in the country? And uh, maybe Dr. Adil Saab also has given the extensive presentation. Uh, maybe one more question for you, Dr. Saab, is that uh, different channels of uh, transmission can be found that impact the firm's performance. How can policymakers adopt the measures that help to mitigate the impact through one channel while other factors are not being instigated? And lastly, for uh, Ms. Nadia, the impact of crisis varied across provinces. How SMIDA's policies uh, can be specialized uh, for each of these provinces so that their specific needs uh, can be fulfilled? So maybe if uh, I can uh, take liberty and start from Ms. Isa. Thank you so much, Kamaz. Um, apologies for earlier because the connection dropped. Uh, just to finish the thoughts um, uh, that I was on uh, last I was speaking on, uh, since we saw a lot of uh, resistance from the commercial banks to finance the SMEs, and uh, one of the objectives of Karandas is to look for a gap in the market and then do a demonstration effect. Based on that, um, the study and everything, we have set up a financial institution in NBFC by the name of Parval, specifically for SME financing, which is currently functioning and uh, people can actually uh, apply for loans over there. Uh, we have a whole functioning team. Currently, we've built a book of uh, 1 billion as it is, and it has an equity base of 3 billion, which is pretty much uh, uh, much higher than what most of the commercial banks have. Uh, other than that, um, as for the question that for the women-led businesses the, for the MSMEs, we actually do run a separate program, which is roughly around 700 million as of now for uh, small women-led uh, businesses. Uh, it's called a Women Venture Program, uh, where we have identified women who are running successful businesses and have provided concessional loans uh, or convertible loans of your equity into those companies. If we are not, because we run, um, and now it's on a rolling basis, anybody can apply on it. Uh, previously, we used to run a challenge round. 
Uh, we also uh, refer the businesses which are large enough and can avail commercial financing. Plus, uh, when I was talking about the corporate governance structure, we when we enter into a women venture program, we always provide them uh, how to do audit, bookkeeping, loans, how to deal with financial institutions to get them investment ready for the next step. So that is something um, as an additionality factor that we do across the table for all our investments, whether it's debt, equity, women ventures, or other SMEs. Um, for the microfinance side, we have PMIC, which is an associated entity of us, which caters to the microfinance business and is a host vendor of the last resort to the MFBs and the MFIs. Uh, other than that, for the infrastructure, since um, it is going to be a massive uh, road ahead for us, given the flood and everything, uh, we have an infrastructure guarantee company, uh, which is set up as well, um, it's called InfraZamin, and that provides guarantees to infrastructure projects. They recently closed a deal with Multinet, uh, which was advertised with HPL. It's a low, uh, it's approximately an $8 billion project, uh, rupees project, which is being uh, guaranteed partially by InfraZamin as of now. So um, we have set up other institutions to cater to every element of the financing need. Uh, thank you for that. If there's any other question, I'll pass on. Otherwise, uh, please. Thank you so much, Mrs. And may I take the freedom for just uh, start from the last panelist? So maybe uh, Dr. Fahim Saab, if you are here. Yeah. Um, I think the question was avoidance of inflation in a crisis. Am I correct? Uh, yeah, exactly. Um, it's a very tough one because you cannot avoid uh, inflation, which is imported. Uh, what you can do is you can cut down on unnecessary transactions, unnecessary uh, usage of resources, and you need to immediately shift towards barter because. Um, it, it seems again and again, every, th every time there is, for example, a specific reference to imported equipment, you have a currency pressure. So somehow, um, it's, I mean, this is a very, very difficult situation. Um, in order to avoid infl and inflation, one has to immediately cut down on one's resource utilization, prune it, prioritize it, and then, of course, do barter wherever you possibly can so that you can conserve resources. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, maybe uh, Ms. Kiran, please. Yes, thank you. So uh, the question was uh, regarding the uh, measures to be adopted or taken up in case of back-to-back uh, -back crisis uh, to the faced by the economy, right? Yes, exactly. Uh, so I think uh, there has to be response at uh, three level. One, three levels. First is the regulation and policy, and I touched upon that briefly during my uh, earlier comments that in case of particularly floods, there has to be a very strong policy and then its regulation uh, and, that, and then the regulation of the sector to, for example, discourage to start with encroachments. And people just cannot continue to construct on uh, river banks. Uh, so that is one, uh, just one broad example. The other one is the response at the institutional level, that the enforcement of these policies and the uh, management of the uh, economic sectors in, in the public domain is going to be extremely important going, going forward. And linked to that is the third response or third uh, set of effort, which has to do with communication, that uh, there has to be very clear communication of what are the measures that the authorities are looking to implement or implementing and, and uh, how the private sector can ensure its cooperation. And it's not just the uh, downstream communication. In fact, uh, if you have to look at upstream then or at the demand side, then the private sector should be able to communicate back to its representatives what is needed from the public sector to ensure that the spaces, uh, physical spaces, for example, or the infrastructure which is provided to them uh, where they can operate is it's safe and it's, uh, it, it, it is sensitive to the um, uh, not just the local norms, but also to the local operating conditions, including your weather, including topography, 
and including uh, any such hazards which can lead to a very strong, uh, which, which can lead to damages. And to the second point, again, on the institutional response, then if there is a force majeure or a condition which is beyond anyone's imagination or, or unprecedented, like we saw in the case of COVID, then the financial sector has to step in and come up with customized packages to provide the relief to the enterprises, because otherwise people are going to continue to, to lose jobs. Uh, forget about even creating more jobs. So th this is what comes to my mind, um, you know, in terms of response to what you're asking. Thank you. And thank you so much, Ms. Kiran. Uh, so I think the next question is regarding Samida. So maybe I can request uh, Ms. Nadia. Uh, Gee, uh, thank you, Mas. Uh, regarding the question, uh, if I got it correctly, that how do we cater for regional diversity in terms of policy measures that Samida undertakes and support that is provided to SMEs? So we have a network of, uh, in, uh, of offices across the country that work in collaboration with the provincial governments. That's our operational mechanism. At the policy level, uh, under the National Coordination Committee on SME Policy, we have provincial working groups that are headed by the respective chief secretaries of each of the province. So that's where all the provincial diversity is catered for in terms of any kind of reform measure that has to be undertaken within that specific provinces context, whether it is related to regulations, whether it is related to any kind of support program that has to come in uh, for the SME sector to cater to their unique needs. Um, just to add, as I mentioned earlier, uh, regarding our damage assessment uh, for floods, again, our regional offices are engaged with the provincial governments, with the PDMAs, and of course, with the SMEs that have been affected in order to conduct the need analysis as well as to identify the areas of support so that we can package a program according to the unique needs of that particular province and going down to the district level as well. So I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much for uh, highlighting the decentralized mechanism of Samita. So maybe lastly, I just wanted to request Dr. Adil uh, for short comments, I, although he has answered in, in the chat box, but uh, maybe if uh, you can summarize your answer, please. Okay, so I have this question regarding how can the policymakers adopt the measures that help to mitigate the impact through one channel while other factors are not being instigated. So I agree that policymakers need to be more holistic in their approach. Uh, so there are several challenges can, that cannot be solved by very specific targeted programs as they may impact different markets. So for instance, to improve cross-border trade, we need to have efficiency in the good markets as well as in the financial market as well as the markets that are supporting trade. So that becomes very important. Again, the government's job should be to facilitate the interaction of different stakeholders that are present in different markets so that the financial markets, like for instance, if we when we have the floods, the housing market and the financial market work together efficiently to make sure that people get their funds or whatever is needed to rebuild, right? So again, uh, the, gov the main thing is that the government should be uh, reducing the cost of information should be increasing facilitating businesses by ensuring that they have the right information so that they can approach the different stakeholders that uh, that are required to naturally encourage their rebuild rebuilding process or whatever it is so that is what it is so and reports like these like, like with the sdpi they are an important factor in that to provide government with the information that is needed so the again research academia also has a big role to play in ensuring that the right measures are told out. So thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Saab. Uh, maybe lastly, I just wanted to just revert back to uh, Aryans for his concluding remarks and maybe what lessons the Pakistan can learn uh, from the experience of developed, developed countries and that may suit us. Uh, so over to you, Aryan. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, much, uh, Mas. I, I, I don't, I don't have lessons. I don't know. It's that time to, uh, to discuss the the lessons from other guys. I, I, I'm just like humbled and I'm blown away by the richness of the lessons that are that are that are coming here. The, um, the policy responses, uh, as we as we hear the 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 gen there's great general policy responses, institute, wonderful institutions. But the devil is in the detail. The responses need to be specific to specific group communities, remote communities. Uh, gender, uh, different 
positions in, in, in the value chains, young, newer enterprises, older enterprises, and, and, and just what Dr. Adil and, and before that uh, Ms. Ms. Said said, it shows us how important the very high quality concrete evidence is to, to, to help uh, steer those responses. I, I, I also, I'm, I'm just, uh, it was so great to hear how the lessons that 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 were being learned from the analysis of the earlier uh, crisis are now being applied and trying to make sure that these are relevant for 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 the current crisis uh, for the for the for the impacts of the flood, which which are at this point of time, of course, hugely more and more devastating than the uh, than the previous crisis. So, so that for me was 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 the lessons about the importance of that concrete, high quality evidence, and to continue to carry that forward in in, in new challenges that uh, that that arise. So, with that, I, I just want to say thank you for for making me part of this. It was it was a wonderful uh, to to learn uh, about this. I, I, uh, I want to thank again SDPI for this work. Uh, I want to wish everybody well, and and of course express our solidarity with the uh, with, with the people that are directly impacted by uh, by by the horrendous uh, flood, and and congratulate everybody for stepping up to 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 support uh, the people that are impacted by this. So uh, thanks very much, Mas. Back to you. Thank you so much, Ariane, uh, for your concluding remarks, and uh, so we are. I think out of time already. So maybe I just want to extend my humble thanks to all the panelists that you have taken so long and uh, give such a holistic remarks and policy recommendations to improve the report maybe and to give these and forward this to the government institutions, hopefully. So thank you again. And we will be sharing the report uh, as we are done with the report. So we will be publishing and uploading it soon. So it will be shared with you all uh, very soon. So thank you so much. Thank you.